As the labor force embarked on their daily duties, Roman watched the rhythmic cadence of their efforts. The workers moved with a synchronized precision that spoke of a well-organized system. Each task, from excavating the earth to transporting materials, was executed with a meticulous care that hinted at a seasoned routine. Roman found himself contemplating the intricacies of their labor. The even distribution of responsibilities among the workers caught Roman's discerning eye. As Roman observed this organized chaos, his thoughts meandered towards the renowned Dimitri Ironwork. Its reputation, he speculated, was not solely a product of well-honed smithing skills. The key lay in the raw materials, the iron ores of the highest quality. The foundation of Dimitri's success was, in part, laid in the innate excellence of these ores. Unlike other estates grappling with losses incurred during the distribution of iron ores, Dimitri seemed immune to such setbacks. The crux of Dimitri's prosperity, Roman deduced, lay in its ability to perform all processes internally. The estate, a self-contained entity, retained a significant portion of the earnings that other estates lost in the intricate web of external transactions. The efficient cycle of, or extraction, processing in the smithy, and eventual distribution was a self-sufficient mechanism that contributed to Dimitri's affluence. It was a model that had sustained the estate for decades. A pivotal factor in Dimitri's economic prowess was its capacity to supply and distribute materials within the estate itself. The strategic location in the city of blacksmiths further amplified the estate's financial standing. The premium placed on the seamless flow of resources within Dimitri's confines was a cornerstone of its prosperity. Roman marveled at the intricate dance of commerce, where each step was carefully choreographed to ensure that Dimitri stood as the unrivaled titan in the realm of ironwork. As Roman delved into these reflections, he became aware of the vast wealth Dimitri had amassed over the years, a wealth that surpassed Roman's initial estimations. It was a revelation that spoke to the enduring success of Dimitri Ironwork. The tranquility of Roman's contemplation was disrupted by Morkan, a seasoned overseer of the mining operations. Morkan's gruff demeanor carried authority as he admonished Roman. This was not a place for idle chatter. It was a realm of toil and sweat. Morkan's directive was clear. Focus on work or depart. Roman, realizing his lapse, apologized to Morkan and pledged to immerse himself in his assigned tasks. Days turned into a week, and the routine of labor persisted. Roman found himself, despite the immersive nature of the work, in a solitary routine during lunch breaks. It became evident that interactions among the workers were scarce, and Roman's attempts to engage in conversation were met with reticence. A subtle territoriality emerged, marking boundaries among the laborers. In the midst of this silent camaraderie, Morkin approached Roman. There was a curiosity in Morkin's eyes, a question that had lingered throughout the week. Why was Roman, a newcomer, toiling in the mines when even Rodwell, the powerful second-born successor of Dimitri, had never graced the iron mines with his presence? Roman, the eldest scion of the Dimitri lineage, took on the guise of a successor in training. To Morkan, the seasoned overseer of the mining operations, it seemed as though Roman might be trivializing the laborious nature of mining work. This perception fueled Morkan's vigilance, prompting him to closely scrutinize Roman's every move. To Morkan's surprise, Roman's approach to the labor-intensive tasks proved to be anything but lackadaisical. In fact, Roman exhibited a fervor for his work that surpassed the expectations of even the discerning overseer. Consistently meeting and often surpassing his assigned quotas, Roman emerged as a diligent contributor to the mining efforts. The intrigue surrounding Roman's presence at the mines deepened when insights from a castle servant revealed that Lord Dimitri had not issued any direct orders for young Master Roman to engage in the toils of the iron mines. This revelation hinted at the possibility that Roman had volunteered for this gritty endeavor. Morkan, grappling with his initial skepticism, decided to confront Roman about his motivations. In a conversation between Roman and Morkan, Roman inquires whether Morkan prefers to hear an idealistic or realistic response. Morkan suggests that Roman provide both answers. Subsequently, Roman begins by sharing his idealistic perspective with Morkan. His idealistic answer delved into a desire to intimately understand the lives of the people within Dimitri. Viewing the city as a mining hub, Roman expressed a genuine curiosity about the daily struggles of those toiling in the iron mines. He sought a first-hand experience, stepping into the shoes of the labor force that formed the backbone of Dimitri's prosperity. Morkan, in response, questioned the necessity of such a personal venture. Roman, unwavering in his conviction, asserted that as long as he bore the Dimitri surname, 
it was incumbent upon him to delve into the lives of those sustaining the city's wealth. It was a duty born out of a sense of connection and responsibility. Carmen, a bystander privy to the exchange, found Roman's idealistic answer to be a reflection of the noble ideals that people yearned for in their rulers. It was an answer that resonated with the populace's perception of nobility and engagement with their subjects. However, Roman's narrative took an unexpected turn as he revealed the realistic answer. Despite the opulence associated with the Dimitri name, Roman acknowledged that the amassed wealth belonged to his father. His presence in the iron mine was not merely a quest for experiential understanding. It was a deliberate effort to contribute meaningfully to Dimitri's prosperity and, perhaps more notably, to rightfully claim his share. Morkin's initial skepticism gave way to laughter at this revelation. The notion that Roman aimed to assert his claim on his father's wealth through the sweat and toil of the mines was a perspective Morkin had not anticipated. Roman's presence, it seemed, was driven by a profound understanding of the dynamics at play within Dimitri. Within the echoes of the mining estate, Morkin extended an invitation to Roman, assuring him that he was willing to address any inquiries that might occupy his thoughts. Roman, with an unending stream of questions, found Morkin to be a patient and informative guide. The revelations that emerged from their dialogue painted a picture of Dimitri's iron mine as a colossal entity, unparalleled in the kingdom and ranking among the continents foremost. This distinction extended to the enigmatic territories known as the edge of the continent, lying beyond the reaches of Dimitri. However, more can, with a seasoned perspective, injected a dose of realism into the grand narrative. Despite the lofty claims, Dimitri's actual output fell short of its inherent potential. The treacherous working conditions within the mine acted as a hindrance, slowing down the mining process and directly impacting overall productivity. Even with the safety measures implemented by Lord Dimitri, the inherent dangers persisted. The northeastern mountain ranges, a home to frequent earthquakes, served as an unpredictable backdrop, underscoring the fragility of human endeavors in the face of natural disasters. Suddenly, the theoretical became tangible as an earthquake shook the mining site. Morcan, quick to respond, rushed to assess the situation. The grim news reached him. The eighth shaft had collapsed, entombing a worker beneath the rubble. The immediate reaction was one of panic and indecision. The looming threat of additional collapses deterred any rash attempts at rescue. In the midst of the chaos, Roman, with a steely determination, offered a bold proposition. He declared his intention to descend into the collapsed shaft to rescue the trapped worker. Morcan, visibly taken aback, expressed genuine concern for Roman's safety. Even the prowess of an Aura Knight, Morkin warned, might not be sufficient if the shaft were to collapse further. Roman's response was resolute and unyielding. He locked eyes with Morkan, reminding him of the responsibility borne by those who carried the Dimitri name. The weight of this responsibility was etched into Roman's gaze, a silent testament to the unwavering commitment he felt towards the legacy of Dimitri. Morkan, stunned by this unexpected display of resolve, could only watch as Roman leaped into action. With a grace that defied the peril below, Roman navigated from one precarious rock to another. The moments stretched into an agonizing wait for those above ground, their collective breaths held in anticipation. Then, against the backdrop of uncertainty, Roman emerged from the depths, the injured worker on his back. The crowd erupted in jubilation, their cheers echoing through the mine, a chorus of relief and gratitude. After emerging from the collapsed shaft, Roman immediately turned his attention to the injured worker, skillfully bandaging their wounds. Morcan, watching this display of adeptness, couldn't help but be surprised at Roman's unexpected proficiency in treating injuries. With the impromptu first aid completed, Roman calmly instructed the workers to transport the injured individual to a doctor. He assured them that he would cover the cost of any potions prescribed for the treatment. The workers promptly mobilized, carrying their fallen comrade on a stretcher to seek medical attention. Once the immediate crisis was addressed, Roman gathered the workers to address the broader implications of the incident. Recognizing that such accidents were often considered the inevitable fate of miners, Roman acknowledged the helplessness that came with sudden disasters. However, he offered a glimmer of hope. As the bearer of the Dimitri name, Roman pledged to tackle the difficulties faced by the miners using any means necessary. What struck Morkin even more was Roman's assurance that this resolution might not take much time. The narrative shifts to Baron Dimitri's office, a space where familial concerns and the weight of decisions converge. Baron Dimitri, a father seeking reassurance about his son's safety, directly questions Roman about the perilous incident. 
In response, Roman offers a calm assurance that he emerged and scathed from the ordeal. However, Baron Dimitri, displaying a father's concern, delves deeper into the motivations behind Roman's daring actions. He points out the inherent dangers in the stark reality that, despite Roman's prowess as an aura swordsman, facing certain challenges alone is fraught with peril. There's an underlying acknowledgement of the vulnerability that even someone with Roman's capabilities can entirely negate. As the conversation unfolds, Baron Dimitri candidly expresses the gravity of the situation. He emphasizes that luck was on Roman's side this time, but the recklessness displayed could have resulted in the loss of his son. It's a stern admonition, devoid of any sense of familial privilege. Baron Dimitri wants Roman to understand the severity of the situation and the potential consequences of such audacious actions. The tone carries a weight that transcends familial bonds. In response, Roman, displaying a resolute demeanor, asserts that he simply did what he felt compelled to do. He maintains that even if given the chance to turn back time, he would make the same decision. There's an unwavering conviction in Roman's words, a steadfast belief in the righteousness of his actions, and an adherence to a personal code that goes beyond the immediate familial context. This stance doesn't sit well with Baron Dimitri, who raises his voice in frustration. He struggles to comprehend why Roman, as the eldest son of the Dimitri family, would choose such a perilous path. Yet, Roman stands firm, asserting that his decision was not guided solely by familial expectations but by a broader sense of responsibility tied to the Dimitri name. Baron Dimitri, perhaps perplexed and exasperated, advises Roman to cease working in the iron mines. From his perspective, this was a decision beyond his understanding. He reiterates that he never asked Roman to undertake such a task and questions the reasoning behind this unconventional choice. Roman, however, counters with an explanation that unveils a deeper understanding of Dimitri's reality. He contends that to truly comprehend the essence of Dimitri, one must venture beyond the realm of the blacksmith's workshop. While acknowledging the family's renown in blacksmithing, Roman emphasizes that the majority of the local populace earns their livelihoods in the iron mines. Thus, his decision to work in the mines was a deliberate effort to bridge the gap between reputation and the lived experiences of the people. Intrigued by this revelation, Baron Dimitri probes further, seeking to understand the insights Roman gained from toiling in the iron mines. Roman, in response, paints a vivid picture of the hardships faced by the workers. He highlights the genuine concern his father exhibits for the treatment and safety of the workers. In the realm of the iron mines, Baron Dimitri commands respect even from the toiling workers. However, despite the concerted efforts to ensure safety, the specter of risk remains an ever-present reality. The workers live with the constant uncertainty of when the earth might tremble, causing the mine to collapse. Baron Dimitri, in the aftermath of such incidents, acknowledges the inherent dangers, emphasizing the challenging truth that preparedness alone cannot completely avert. Roman, ever resourceful, proposes a solution to mitigate the pervasive risks, the use of magical artifacts. These enchanted items, Roman suggests, can fortify the safety of the mine. Baron Dimitri, while acknowledging their potential, questions the practicality, pointing to the considerable cost associated with implementing such measures. Roman, undeterred by the financial implications, stresses the potential benefits that extend beyond mere safety measures. In presenting his case, Roman introduces the concept of opportunity cost, emphasizing that while the upfront investment in magical artifacts may be substantial, the subsequent increases in iron or production could far outweigh these initial expenses. He envisions a scenario where not only does safety improve, but the development of undiscovered mines is no longer hindered. It's a strategic proposal that seeks to turn an expenditure into an investment with long-term gains. Moreover, Roman advocates for a proactive approach to safety by establishing a dedicated team. This team, he suggests, could work tirelessly to reduce risks and improve overall safety measures. He then proposes utilizing a portion of the increased profits for the welfare of the workers, creating a holistic approach that not only safeguards lives but also enhances the well-being of those contributing to Dimitri's prosperity. Baron Dimitri, initially skeptical, finds himself intrigued by Roman's comprehensive approach. He acknowledges Roman's thoughtful considerations and sees the potential for a paradigm shift in the way the mines are managed. Encouraged by Roman's insights, Baron Dimitri seeks more concrete details, asking Roman about the financial investment required and the supporting evidence for such a venture. It's a pivotal moment where familial concerns intersect with economic and social considerations, reflecting the intricate balance required in managing a domain like Dimitri. 
Meanwhile, the narrative shifts to the broader Miram world, a realm marked by the dichotomy of the weak and the strong. In this intricate web of power dynamics, two groups stand out for their prowess in information gathering, Jaybang Goa and Halmoon. Jaybang Goa, through beggars scattered across the world, listens to people's stories to collect information. On the other hand, Halmoon focuses on socially vulnerable groups, leveraging their connections to gather valuable insights. In a strategic move, Roman opted to immerse himself in the iron mines rather than the blacksmith's trade. His decision was motivated by a broader ambition, to grasp vital information from the Northeast region. Armed with his father's financial backing and a robust workforce, Roman envisioned establishing How Moon's information gathering dominance in their world. However, Roman remained cognizant that this initiative needed amplification. While How Moon's influence would be formidable in the Northeast, Roman recognized the necessity of expanding beyond these regional confines. The quest for information demanded a continent wide perspective. Realizing the limitations of his current team in handling this monumental task professionally, Roman concluded that he needed someone adept at collecting and organizing information. Furthermore, he aimed to forge stronger connections with the upper echelons of Dimitri to bolster these efforts. The narrative then transitioned to Dimitri's training ground, where Chris, a seasoned figure, gathered the soldiers for an unexpected announcement. He revealed Roman's gift, instruction in the use of mana and swordsmanship. The soldiers, Initially taken aback by this surprising development, soon learned of its significance. Chris dispelled any skepticism surrounding the mana method, emphasizing its intrinsic value beyond mere market speculation. Lucas, a soldier with initial doubts, anticipated a trivial instruction from Roman, expecting to be told to roll on the market floor for a treasure. However, Chris unveiled the mana method's name, Azura, denoting the ghost of the battlefield in a distant foreign language. This revelation elevated the soldiers' perception of the training from mere market fodder to a potent and meaningful discipline. As the soldiers began to engage with the Azura method, Lucas, initially skeptical, experienced a remarkable transformation. In just a few days, he felt a heightened sensitivity, perceiving the wind on his skin with newfound acuity. The Azura sword method, consisting of 108 ways to engage an enemy, emerged as a comprehensive and powerful technique. Lucas found himself in a state of disbelief, grappling with the mystery that was Roman Dimitri. The question echoing in his mind was, who is Roman Dimitri? As Lucas pondered this, he considered the unique skills possessed by Roman, the Azura and the Azura Sword. If Lucas were in a similar situation, holding such exclusive abilities, he decided he would guard this knowledge as an absolute secret, not only from his fellow soldiers, but even from his blood relatives. Lucas, having experienced the loss of all his wealth, understood the hardships that life could inflict. Amidst the disturbances and challenges that had characterized his existence, the training with the Azura method emerged as a source of happiness and empowerment. It was in this state of contemplation and personal growth that Lucas found himself. The narrative then shifted to Roman's office, where Lucas mustered the courage to share a profound decision. Instead of joining the Information Guild, Lucas expressed his desire to align himself with Master Roman. Roman pondered the notion that rejection was an unacceptable outcome, drawing from Lucas's vast experience among seasoned mercenaries with extensive networks, having weathered tests and undergone various life-altering changes. In Roman's perspective, Lucas stood out as the right individual for the task. Lucas, in turn, conveyed to Roman that if he were in charge of the Information Guild, he would have to part ways with Roman. During the war with Barco, Lucas had sworn to dedicate his life to safeguarding Roman. He implored Roman not to send him elsewhere. Despite Roman's recognition of Lucas's acting prowess, he couldn't help but question Lucas about the origins of his proficiency in the aura skill and the Azura sword. In response, Lucas admitted his ignorance, prompting Roman to remind him of the gifts bestowed as tokens of loyalty. Curious, Roman inquired about Lucas's perception of him. Roman clarified that he didn't seek blind loyalty. Rather, it was the inherent cost of following Roman onto the battlefield and risking one's life. Eager to explore the depths of loyalty, Roman questioned what Lucas believed he would offer to someone deserving more than Roman soldiers. Lucas, taken aback, wondered if there existed anything beyond the Aura method. Resolute, he pledged to follow Roman's orders and vowed to establish the finest information guild on the continent. Recognizing Lucas's quick and logical mind, Roman appointed him as the head of the Halmon Information Guild. The scene then shifted to the Iron Mines, where miners enthusiastically welcomed Roman upon his visit. Grateful for saving a miner's son, Roman received expressions of deep gratitude. 
The worker pledged his life to Roman's service if needed in the future. Roman expressed appreciation and anticipated future cooperation. The public sentiment toward Dimitri turned in Roman's favor from that day on, creating an atmosphere that greatly irked Baron Romero.